The third dimension is terror. What if I told you there was an on-rail shooter collection that had giant insects, space battles, hidden temples, robot invasions, killer sharks, and spooky scary skeletons, all of which was available for home consoles, including the rail shooter friendly Nintendo Wii. Now, what if I told you that game was terrible shovelware? Attack of the Movies 3D is a 2010 home console rail shooter for the Xbox 360 and Nintendo Wii. It was developed by Panic Button, who would go on to do almost nothing but console ports of big name titles. What games are original are best described as shovelware with generally unfavorable reviews. Movies 3D was their third ever game. Yeah, this is going to be a negative review. I know that's not often the case with my reviews so far, so if you were here for only the good vibes, I apologize. But I think it's important for the overall quality of a craft to be able to go back and analyze negative traits, just as much, if not more, than positive ones. And Attack of the Movies 3D is probably the worst rail shooter I've ever seen that didn't loop back into being just so bad it's good. I'll get to the wonderfully awful rail games I know about eventually, but for now we're going to take a look at an example of what not to do in the rail shooter genre. No real disclaimer on this one, by the way. I really doubt anyone is going to mind if I spoil such a rightfully forgotten game as this one. And unlike most other media I have or will review on this channel, I don't think anyone should be playing this game directly rather than saving their time, money, and patience with this video. In other words, I played it so you don't have to. There isn't any overarching story or characters to tie the levels together. Rather, it is framed as you watching various big budget films in a cinema setting. This doesn't carry over into the levels themselves, but it means the menus are all red curtains and black seats. The only way that this theming is used, that is better than a generic menu, is that the levels are all represented by movie posters. These posters are all better than the levels themselves, but they also all say now playing, even if the level is still locked. Speaking of better art than levels, the box cover is pretty cool looking. We got a shark and skeleton attacking moviegoers, and it's a decently exciting scene. Except, the praying mantis and flying saucer in the back are not in the game at all. There are spaceships and giant insects, but anyone hoping for alien greys riding mantises will be dreadfully disappointed. Looking at the levels themselves, they must be played in a specific order. All but one of them is locked at first, and you must complete the previous level before starting the next. While this was likely an attempt at a basic progression system, I can't help but think that this was to ensure the giant bug level was played first. You'll see why in a bit. For now, let's just play the first level. Off-brand Earth Defense Force. I mean, Insect Invasion. Neutralize any nearby insect threats and exterminate the giant scorpion. Three, two, one, action. We are in the middle of a city as the insect invasion is already underway. We start off inside a cafe. The basic enemy of this level, orange red ants, pop out of the ground and melee attack. The amount of time they need to run up to us is a fair enough window to shoot them down. Gameplay fairness will be an important topic in a second. After the orange ants will be the blue, black ants. The blue ants are ranged attackers, who spit out orbs of green goo at you. This makes them, hands down, the most difficult enemy of the game. The moment these assholes spawn in, they start firing. This is hypothetically fine. You could shoot away the projectiles before taking damage, and while the first fire is immediate, the following projectiles are at wide intervals. If you shoot the glob and then the ants, you shouldn't take any damage. The problem is, is that the projectiles very often go off screen. Not only that, but your hitbox is wider than your view, meaning you can take damage from off screen enemies and projectiles. To make matters even worse, while the ant only fires in a single direction arc, the path of the player often goes directly into an already shot projectile. Game, you can't have timed forward shots in a rail shooter. 
the player cannot control the movement, so they cannot dodge or change their movement pattern. They just have to hope that the projectile is on screen long enough to be shot down. But as I said before, a lot of damage is from off screen. This, right here, makes blue ants the hardest enemy of the game, and they are spammed often in this level. We peek outside to the cafe patio and are given a taste of the level's boss. Scorpion Boss. Triple shot. You can get a good start on his health bar as he climbs down, but he quickly traps you in the cafe. You have a view of his face to do damage, but occasionally you'll have to dodge its pincers. On the Wii, this is done by tilting the remote, which is a pain because you aim by pointing. This is also the biggest pain with the reloading system, but I'll get to that in its own section. Not that the dodging system matters much. After all, this is the only level that uses it. Anyway, we scare off the giant arachnid and return outside. Blue wasps are added to the enemy roster, and while they are spammed as much as the blue ants, they take a moment to hug your face before stinging, giving a fair attack window. Fun fact, if you kill ants on the side of a wall, their death animation uses the wall as the source of gravity. Heading to the edge of the patio, we see a survivor fending off ants from the top of a van. As far as I can tell, survivors cannot be rescued or killed, and never appear outside of this level. Moving on, we eventually get the brilliant idea to get off the patio. We hop to the top of a van to circumvent the stairs. Ants try to nip at our heels, but they don't actually do any damage. We clear a path across the street, adding red projectile shooting wasp to the roster. Their stingers are identical to arrows we'll see later in the game, and are placed where you'll likely shoot them clear while trying to get the insect. They also don't adjust their aim any, so depending on their placement, they'll miss you entirely. As ants swarm us, a helicopter comes in. Ignoring all of the trapped civilians fighting for their lives around us, the chopper picks us up and flies us into every blue ant projectile on or off screen in order to deal us an unreasonable amount of unavoidable damage. Eventually, the helicopter's casual fly over the city brings us to the top of the buildings. Scorpion Box. Wow, we're somehow more invincible than a normal rail shooter protagonist. Impressive, considering the high bar. The second round of the Scorpion boss is similar to the first. You have to shoot its face, wiggle the Wii remote to dodge, and just tear into it. Halfway through the fight, we'll get some distance, and the Scorpion will proceed to yeet sweeps of blue ants at you. Yeah, I'm just happy they aren't shooting me from off screen this time. At a fourth health, we'll return to the previous attack pattern. It'll only take a few seconds to finish it off. And all of that, this whole level, was only 5 minutes long. For comparison, Resident Evil Umbrella Chronicles, another Wii console rail shooter, is listed on HowLongToBeat.com at 7.5 to 21 hours. Attack of the Movies 3D is listed at 1 hour. Yeah. I hope you like this first level too, because it is significantly higher quality than the rest of the game. It's also significantly more difficult, but that's almost entirely because of the Blue Ant Menace. As far as gameplay goes, it's as generic as a rail shooter can get. You aim with the Wii Remote and press either A or B to shoot. Simple as that. No grenades, weapon management, or gimmicks. The actual alignment of the cursor to where you are pointing is rather questionable, but it works most of the time. The time it doesn't work is when you reload. To emulate the shoot off screen style of reloading common in arcade games, Attack in the Movies reloads by flicking downward. This is broken. For one, the motion controls only register three fourths of the time. Two, unlike the smooth aim off screen of an arcade reload, 
The violent downward motion of movies required to register the action breaks concentration quite often, as you have to constantly check if the motion was successful. At some point, I would just treat the controls like maracas whenever I attempted to reload. Thankfully, these problems are fixed with emulation. Now, while this game was clearly designed for the Wii, it was also ported to the Xbox 360. This version is overall identical to its Wii counterpart, and it does nothing to take advantage of the increased graphics or power. But if it's on the Xbox, how do you aim? Well, the aiming, firing, and everything else is just mapped wholesale to the default controller. If you've ever played a rail shooter with a non-aiming controller, you just flinched. First-person shooters already suffer from moving from mouse to controller. Now make that fast-paced and mostly out of your control. Early reviews of this game make it clear that it's an unpleasant experience, and the Wii version is significantly better. Up next is the second level, off-brand Star Wars Trilogy. I mean, Cosmic Combat. Fly into the enemy mothership and destroy it from the inside. Three, two, one, action! Cosmic Combat is a notable step down from Insect Invasion, and unfortunately that will continue to be the case until we reach the final level. A problem unique to the space level is its terrible readability. The player's laser shots take up a lot of screen space. The same green, yellow, and blue is used for everything. And to simulate space flight, the camera is floaty and rotates pitch in a way that doesn't always match the hypothetical ship's actual movements. Location-wise, we are circling through these shielded hangars before diving into a legally distinct Death Star's exhaust port to blow up its core. Our first enemies are these basic red and green ships. While their lasers are not blockable and their green color makes them near impossible to see, the time it takes for the ships themselves to align before shooting makes a fair attack window. A bit more common are these blue turrets. While they have a fair attack window, the ship is so often zooming around them that lining up a shot before we pass by and take damage is where the challenge comes in. Still, I think this is the first enemy so far that can adjust their aim after the spawn animation, though it does seem that it comes at the cost of their projectiles being invisible more often than not. Another bit with them is that they are often hidden inside the hangars we fly through. Unfortunately, the green lasers walling off the hangar stop our laser fire, but not theirs, which is used for a cheap shot more than once. As we skim along the hole or dip into the hangars, we'll pass by these mini cores. These don't seem to damage us or affect our progress, but destroying them nets you some extra points. There are melee attackers in this level in the form of these rotating yellow ships. They aren't used often, and the time you have to destroy them before they hit you is way longer than necessary. Oddly enough, the main area you face them is also littered in asteroids, which are identical in gameplay save that they break down into multiple smaller rocks when destroyed. The zoom around the hangars outstays its welcome just a bit taking up a majority of the level. At some point, we enter the exhaust port of the large ship. We weave through the vents, taking out turrets as we do. Unfortunately, the speed of our ship never adjusts or speeds up, making this potentially exciting part a rather casual affair. While the camera tries to show a few close calls of us almost ramming into pillars, the slow pace removes all the tension. Eventually, we make it to the core and the boss of this level. Reactor Core Box. Yeah, just shoot it in the same spot without moving. You'll eventually strip the armor and hit the core directly. While you do take damage from the turrets around you, it's better to ignore them and continue shooting without moving at the core. It honestly doesn't matter how much armor the core builds up on itself. Just shoot in the same spot, unmoving, and you'll win. While we're between levels, let's talk about the weapons and power-ups. First off, a compliment. 
I like how each player's base weapon is changed to match each level's theme, and this is reflected in the sound and on-screen effects. For example, so far Insect Invasion has had a normal pistol, while Cosmic Combat had lasers. To take away from this, the actual behavior of the weapons and the icons in the HUD remain unchanged between levels, which is a shame. These are little things, but little things add up, both good and bad. So, while the base gun is functionally a basic pistol, there are power-ups that you shoot to get temporary weapons. These appear to work based on a set amount of ammo, but to make things complicated, you can reload several times before using all of said ammo. It would have been much better to just list the entire ammo amount on screen and turn off reloads. But what do I think this is? Carnival? Oh well. The first weapon pickup is the triple shot, which shoots three bullets per fire. Rapid shot is a machine gun, letting you hold down the button to continuously fire. The final weapon power-up requires a secret code to unlock. It, it's mega shot. It's mega shot. Which unlocks the, wait for it, mega shot power-up. Mega shot is hypothetically the best power-up, especially in terms of damage. But it has one major flaw. It has a blind spot in the dead center of its aim. In other words, if you aim at an enemy far enough away and it's in the center of your reticle, you will miss. Yeah, no, that's a pretty big flaw. That in mind, Rapid Shot has the highest DPS by far and is a much better power-up. In addition to weapons, you can also pick up point boosts, health boosts, and extra lives. Points don't matter. Health boosts are nice, as you have a single health bar that is shared between all players, but I do think they're too common after the first level. Extra lives let you keep playing after you die, but they will still send you back to the last checkpoint. Between this and the fact they respawn after death, you can end up trapped in a gameplay loop until you give up or get good. Don't bother farming them though, as they reset between levels. Up next is off-brand Maze of Kings. I mean, off-brand Deadstorm Pirates. I mean, into the Emperor's Tomb. Destroy the Guardian of the Ancient Tomb and recover the priceless item. Three, two, one, action. All right, so I'm sure you've already noticed one of the problems unique to this level. The tomb's entrance is Indian, the enemies are Aztec, and spoilers, but the final boss is referred to as a golem, which is Jewish. Golem has since broadened to mean any animated stone humanoid, so I'm willing to forgive that. But everything else is from very specific, but different cultures. It's more than possible that they did this to stop their Indiana Jones-style temple from resembling a specific culture. But in that case, they should have gone a more vague route to their designs. Because the final product is closer to a pick-and-mix of culture-specific words and design. It definitely comes off more as incompetence and a throw-in-anything-vaguely-exotic mindset. To put it nicely, the ideas and assets of this level clash. A lot. Going into the level itself, we start off at the entrance of a stone temple. We are riding in a minecart, the track of which conveniently travels through the entire temple. Perched along the walls of the entrance are this level's primary enemy, these Aztec stone dudes. They become possessed and start to slowly throw destructible magic balls at you. These guys are very slow. Slow to wake up, slow to throw projectiles, slow to shoot again. The windows to kill them are ridiculously long. You also see several inactive ones at any given time, but you can't do any damage until their eyes turn red. Entering the tomb itself, we pass by our secondary enemies. These arrows shooting Quetzalcoatl stone faces. These are the same arrows that are shot as stingers from the red wasp of the first level. Speaking of, blue wasps make a return here, and are the only case of a returning enemy in the entirety of the game, which is legit surprising all things considered. Also, fuck you bees! We ride the minecart back and forth along the halls, and it's way more repetitive than should be allowed. It feels like you are just repeating the same four or so sets over and over. The exception is the elevators, which slowly lower the first time and are an easily survived trap the second time. This brings up the second major problem of this level, its pacing. My god, the pacing of this level is so slow that a legless turtle could outrun it. Rail shooters are fast-paced and are often literal roller coasters. 
but this level is far closer to a leisurely stroll. The movement is slow, the enemy attacks are slow, and I bet it would be much faster if we just ditched the minecart entirely and walked down the hall rather than dip into every side path. Slow or not, we eventually reach this lava pyramid. At the top is our Indiana Jones statue that belongs in a museum. Here we meet the red melee variants of the stone statues who are somehow even slower than the normal variant. We climb the stairs, grab the idol, sit in genuine surprise that they didn't do the giant rolling rock trap, and bail back into the minecart. We ride that baby over a few rooms of lava and right to the boss of this level. Golem box. The rock golem boss is just a giant red stone man with nothing below the belt. He will throw rows of rocks at you while you circle around him. Every couple of throws, he'll switch to knocking stalactites off the ceiling. Keep in mind that while the rocks can face through the pillars, your shots can't. All of these projectiles can be shot away, and only serve as distraction from your goal of damaging the boss. After a bit of hitting the big guy, he'll drop. Next level is Off-Brand Terminator. I mean, Robot Rebellion. Liberate the city from the machines, but beware of the Sentinel gunship. Three, two, one. Action. Robots have invaded the now-ruined city. It seems we are way too late to, quote, liberate the city, considering it seems there are no humans left to liberate. Oh well. Get off my lawn, you damn dirty trash cans! Our first model of the tin can variety is a tank. Just a straight up tank. Don't worry, we are using armor piercing pistols. That's good, as the floating drones, drop turrets, and humanoid robot enemies are all ranged. They all have fair attack windows and occasionally poor aim. For melee enemies, we have these giant and easily visible landmines, which in any other game would be easy to walk around. Unfortunately, this on rails game insists, and I mean insists, on walking you right into damage whenever possible. We catch a break in that these mines are only used during the first phase of the the Sentinel boss. Speaking of, the boss of this level dips in to harass us two times. First time is while we are under this highway. Sentinel gunship boss. It shoots at us a few times, but we utterly wreck his ship before bailing through the live landmine. I guess the ship decided that we're dumb enough to get ourselves killed without his help, so he leaves us alone for a bit. Some way down the road and past some normal enemies, a completely different hovercopter starts dropping missiles at us. These are easily shot away. Just know that the propellers don't count in the hitbox. You have to shoot the capsules themselves. We never see this aircraft again, and I was under the impression it was the Sentinel boss until reviewing the footage later. Eventually, we reach the actual final boss fight. Sentinel gunship boss. And yes, it just broke a rail shooter rule by teleporting us. He's back to all his health, but it doesn't really matter. The ship dips in and out of sight, tossing a handful of missiles at us before he just decides to die. And with that, we've saved the city. The on fire, wrecked, and completely destroyed city. Woo? Alright, time for the next level. Off-brand Ocean Hunter. I mean, Deep Sea Danger. Discover the secret undersea lab and destroy the experimental sea monster. Three, two, one, action! We open up rather promising. We have two flavors of shark, both swimming by and attacking. Eels come up out of nowhere to bite our face off. Good, good, and that's the only two basic enemies that are aquatic creatures. The rest of the common enemies are mechanical or explosive. Not only that, but after we go down into the trench, the sharks and eels are only used a few times each for the rest of the game. 
If you don't understand why that is a major disappointment, then please go watch my Ocean Hunter review. Sea creatures make excellent and terrifying rail shooter enemies, and this game tosses them aside the moment it can in favor of boring sub-drones, depth charges, and the least powerful sea mines I've ever seen. And it just repeats this Sea Lab 2020 set four or so times, and that's the whole level up to the boss. No, I'm not kidding or exaggerating. Boss time. Kraken boss. The Kraken is better described as the end result of a one-night stand between a cartoon antlion and a giant squid. His only weak spot is the inside of his mouth, which will flash white when damaged. He typically blocks his face with his arms, but will break stance to throw debris at you, pull you in for a kiss, or scream at you. Such a charmer. He'll do this for the entire battle. There's no phases or anything like that, so just keep shooting his mouth and you're good. Let's go ahead and jump into our final level, off-brand House of the Dead. I mean, Graveyard Gunfight. Eradicate the ancient evil that lives under the haunted graveyard. Three, two, one. Action. While Insect Invasion definitely had the most put into it in terms of enemies and set pieces, I would say that Graveyard Gunfight is the best level in terms of actual quality. The graveyard is filled to the brim with possessed skeletons, who burst out of the ground to get you. There is a chance they'll get back up after being killed to have another go, which is funny more than difficult. Even though they come in multiple flavors of color and glowiness, their behavior seems to be independent of their model. Most skeletons will lumber over to get a whack at you, but occasionally one will run or throw screaming skulls at you. I actually really like this enemy, as it has far more design work put into it than previous creatures. We climb up the hill, and despite the movie poster advertising the house as being the main location of the level, we walk right past it. We don't actually enter the house at any point. Continuing along the path, we are attacked by bats. While there is a cloud of non-shootable bats passing by, they are not a swarm enemy and only a few fully modeled bats actually attack or are killed. They also come in a fire variant that will shoot destructible fireballs at you. We enter the crypt, which is definitely way too big to be structurally sound. From the coffins come mummies, who take quite a few bullets to take down compared to previous enemies. Thankfully, they are also stunned when hit. I have to point out how wonderfully cartoony the walk cycle is for both the mummies and the skeletons, though. Both cycles remind me of Grabbed by the Ghoulies, or a similar Rare-style game. It's a shame that that level of personality didn't stretch to the other enemies of the game. Speaking of personality, after a couple coffin rooms, we reach the final boss. Crypt Monster Boss. I love this boss. It looks straight out of Nightmare Before Christmas and its design plays great into the 3D aspect. Where was this level of creativity during the rest of the game? First phase, you wail on the boss while his arms, which are actually separate creatures, spit goo at you. After enough damage, the boss will hide his body and the camera will focus on the arms off to the side. Kill them before they get a bite in, which is telegraphed by stiff movements. Clear both sides to pull the main boss back out, repeating the pattern. After three rounds, we take him down. <laughs> And that was Attack of the Movies 3D. There's no leaderboards online or local, so scores are not even saved. I guess that's it. I would say go home, but you're already there. To say this game was rough is an understatement. Take how they handle difficulty, for example. Rather than add or subtract enemies based on your chosen difficulty, it simply adjusts the number of health and damage done. Not only that, but the numbers are balanced for four players. So on the busy insect level, the difficulty becomes almost unplayable unless you have a full team. But on the other levels, it just makes everything slower and sloggier. Speaking of multiplayer, the game also doesn't adjust anything based on the number of current players. 
Enemy health and placement is still the same. They don't change their behavior at all. The health bar is shared between all players, and so on. That's sad considering all the links most rail shooters go through to adjust for balance based on players or difficulty settings. Looking at the graphics, it's okay. Solid for the Wii, but as I mentioned before, nothing has changed for the Xbox 360 version. So the graphics are absolutely terrible given the power of that system. The whole game looks rather cartoony, but not in a purposeful way. Save for the graveyard level. In fact, the graveyard level is the only one that doesn't look like shovelware. Though I would still say it's below standard. I am happy to say though that this game did do something right, the 3D. In fact, I would say the 3D is above average. It's still red and blue lenses style, and that comes with inherent problems, such as messed up colors and loss of readability. But in terms of what was in control of the devs, it's great. The UI pops out, the shots fired by the player look like they're coming from the corners towards the enemies. The enemies often take advantage of the camera, etc, etc. The graveyard in particular takes full advantage of the 3D. From the entrance pulling you in, to the screaming skulls, to the big old eyeball of the final boss at the end. It does 3D better than most 3D movies, and I think it does as well as it could with the red-blue style glasses, which it comes with four of. Before I forget the music, it's okay and resembles classic movie scores, which was the point. However, because of that, I'll likely be copyright claimed by YouTube and have to replace it. We'll see. All in all, I wouldn't recommend Attack of the Movies short of getting it 100% free. It's an hour of gameplay that any rail shooter fan would get bored with in no time. It's beyond disappointing considering how, if the game had been done right, it could have easily been very successful in a very untapped genre. It's not even good for a younger audience, considering just how dull it is compared to other games. It's very much in the category of shovelware, and if you were considering emulating it, then your time and effort would be better spent setting up a better game. To save y'all the trouble, I'll be linking my own playthrough in the description, as usual. Even if it's not for me, a video playthrough is all you should need to satisfy any further curiosity. I hope you guys have a good year. If all goes as planned, then a certain pirate-themed rail shooter and Egyptian-themed rail shooter should be coming out later this year. Either way, I want to go and watch Jaws 3D now. Bye! Bite my shiny metal ass!